Um, I want to welcome you all to our uh, panel today. I'm Angela Stent. I'm a senior non-resident fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe. And this, of course, is a panel commemorating the 30th anniversary since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The current tensions between Russia and Ukraine remind us that for, for Vladimir Putin, the final contours of that collapse are not yet settled and they could be reversed. 30 years ago, it's also very difficult to grasp how a nuclear superpower, the largest country in the world, spanning 12 time zones, could simply have imploded because of its own internal divisions instead of being defeated in a war. For many inside and outside Russia, it's easier to believe that the Soviet collapse was the result of outside agency, namely the United States and its special services, or a conspiracy between Saudi Arabia and the United States to keep oil prices low and thus hasten the Soviet disintegration. So this raises several important questions. Why and how did the USSR collapse? Was the collapse inevitable? How do we explain what came afterwards? And why, at least from the West point of view, did things turn out so differently than many had hoped or some had feared? So we have a stellar panel today to answer these questions. Um, unfortunately, our first panelist is still having some technical difficulties. He will hopefully join us soon. So I am gonna introduce him and the rest of the speakers and we'll get the rest of the discussion going. So um, Vladislav Zubok, who is still trying to log on, he's a professor of history at the London School of Economics, and he's the author of an outstanding new book, Collapse, The Fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and he is going to talk about the inevitability of the collapse and how history might have turned out differently. Donald Jensen, who's the Director of Russia and Strategic Stability at the US Institute of Peace, was a diplomat working at the US Embassy in Moscow during the turbulent years uh, prior to 1991. And he's going to talk about how the US tried to understand what was happening in Russia and the Soviet Union and how much they got right or wrong. Fiona Hill, a senior fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe and author of There's Nothing Here for You, her excellent book dealing with, among other things, with the topic of, if you like, the fall and rise of Russia. And she will reflect on the meaning of the collapse and what came afterwards. Pavel Bayev, a non-resident uh, scholar at the uh, Center on the United States and Europe, will talk about the military implications of the collapse. Um, and finally, James Goldgeier, who's a visiting fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe, and co-author with Michael McFall of the book Power and Purpose, which discusses US-Russian relations in the 1990s. He will talk about how the H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations dealt uh, with the new Russia. So I'm uh, uh, glad to see that Vladislav Zubok has rejoined us. I did uh, introduce you and told the uh, audience about your book. So please, why don't you begin our discussion? Uh, thank you, Angela, and I'm very grateful that uh, you, you you invited me to this. Uh, Brookings has a special place in my life and my heart. Uh, back in the spring of 1989, I worked in the library of Brookings, learning a, a lot, uh, reading Ray Gardhoff, uh, Strobe Talbot, Bob Jervis, and others. So um, uh, a few words about my book, and if you suddenly see me disappearing, uh, don't blame it on, on Vladimir Putin, just blame it on unstable internet. Um, so uh, basically, um, 30 years ago, the accepted wisdom became uh, that the death of the Soviet Union was inevitable. And yet, before the collapse, nobody thought so. Uh, it was a major surprise. So this puzzle inspired my book, Collapse. And the evidence I presented in this book challenges powerful established narratives. Observers and historians explain the collapse mostly by long-term structural factors, such as a bankrupt planned economy, defunct communist ideology, Cold War pressures, anti-Russian nationalism in borderlands, and so on and so forth. Among triggers and contingency factors, people also mention Reagan's Star Wars, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, falling oil prices, anti-alcohol campaign, Chernobyl disaster, and glasnost that shook Soviet identity. My book argues that all those factors, important as they were, did not doom the Soviet Union. 
Perhaps the most powerful narrative the book challenges is the one of a great visionary leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who ended the Cold War, unified Germany, let go Eastern Europe, and dismantled the communist system. All this is true, but despite all those monumental achievements, uh, Gorbachev was, for some reason, uh, repudiated by his own people. Some Western narratives focus on the great man and mention with regret that the Russians fail to appreciate great things he had done. Mikhail Gorbachev is in the center of my book, but the focus is on, not on his achievements, but on his monumental failure in his pursuit to reform the Soviet Union. The book argues that Gorbachev's reforms and choices were the primary driver behind the quick Soviet demise, in particular, his ill-designed economic reforms and rapid political liberalization. Gorbachev's economic reforms ruined the ruble and left the center without funds. His political constitutional reforms triggered mutinies across the Soviet Union, of which the most fateful and the most underappreciated in the West was the phenomenon of Brexit, separatism of the Russians, whose discontent found a leader in the person of Boris Yeltsin. The Russians wrecked the empire that many thought was theirs, and the central state as well. Different Russians were moved by different motives from liberal anti-communism to nationalism. A major political factor, however, was the common perception among the Russians of Gorbachev's failure as a leader, his inability to stop rapid descent of the country into economic misery and political chaos. As the failing reforms led to a perfect storm that engulfed the Soviet ship, Gorbachev proved to be a remarkably hapless captain, unable to make tough choices at the moments when the situation called for, for them. The role of Ukraine in the Soviet collapse has been recently quite exaggerated, and I argue in my book that the Ukrainian factor was not central. It was a consequence, not the cause of the implosion at the center. The same can be said about the role of the Bolts and their bid for independence, with all respect for this struggle. The Bolts were the first to realize that the tug of war among the Russians in Moscow, emblematized by the feud between Yeltsin and Gorbachev, was a gift from heaven and they took full advantage of it. To sum up, the USSR was killed by the implosion of the center, not by the pressures from the periphery. Because of the unstable internet and uh, the pressure of time, I would like uh, to conclude with a few observations that link this history I've just described to the current moment. Many Western friends, colleagues, journalists ask, how did Gorbachev's failure lead, lead to Vladimir Putin? Last Sunday, a long documentary produced by a pro-Kremlin journalist made this particular link. The Soviet collapse, the film argued, led to a time of troubles and Putin restored the Russian state and salvaged Russians from a permanent misery and statelessness. I would argue that Putin drew major lessons from the story of the Soviet collapse, and I'm glad to have Fiona Hill on the panel. Uh, she wrote more extensively about Putin, but I would venture with my, my few observations of my own. Putin vowed to maintain macroeconomic stability and budget balance at any cost. He amassed huge financial reserves as a safety measure to avoid being as bankrupt as Gorbachev had become. Putin was unwilling to open his coffers even in the time of pandemics. And he dedicated huge resources held by oil prices to the restoration of state power, the army, police, and monopoly on violence. Yet, uh, I would uh, dare to say there's a lesson that Putin struggles with. The USSR was a confederation, and so is Russia. The USSR broke up irrevocably when its core, the Russian Federation, claimed independence and sovereignty. Could the same happen to modern Russia as well? The Russian constitution is now one-way street, no exit for the subjects of federation, including the annexed Crimea and the conquered Chechnya. Yet, major risks remain. As the story of 1991 shows, the main source of instability for the state can be not only rebellious national minorities, but also the Russian majority, when for economic or some other historical reasons, this majority becomes disillusioned with the state and its leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vlad. John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, good to be on a panel with all my friends and colleagues from here at Brookings. Uh, in my youth as my beginning diplomat, I, had a, I suffered, enjoyed, and experienced a variety of exciting events all within the space of a few years. Uh, the end of the Soviet Union, 
uh, or the, the, the rundown of the Soviet Union, embassy tour during the coup, going back in 93 during the shootout on the streets of Moscow, which I think is also part of the story. And then finally, uh, in 1995, a vodka fueled debrief of Khrushchev and some of the other coup plotters after they got out of prison, which in many ways confirmed to me how, uh, how much we missed. So I wanted, while there's a lot to say about uh, the mid nineties and the role of the oligarchs, I just wanted to say a few words about the point of view from the embassy, uh, what we missed, which was a lot, what we misunderstood, which was probably even more, and Vlad, I loved your book, and it brought back uh, an incredible a, a theater of characters, which I had almost forgotten about in many cases. So let me start with uh, what we misunderstood. I don't think among my colleagues in the coffee houses and cafes around DC, there was ever even a serious discussion about the USSR collapsing or whatever we say it has become today. It was always sort of assumed it would continue in some form or another. Uh, maybe Gorbachev could reform it. We just didn't know for sure. And uh, for me, the uh, literary polls were the Feinsod book, which I grew up with at Columbia, and also the revision by Jerry Huff, How Russia Was Governed, as if it was a normal country. Now, I never thought it was a normal country, but I thought it would continue at least for a generation, at least. And uh, it didn't. And I think we, and I'm, that's one reason I'm grateful for Vlad about his book, we have not really grappled with a lot of this still after 30 years. Uh, second, I think there was an assumption that the forces challenging the USSR were largely driven by Democrats, a desire for a Western style uh, pluralist political and economic system. And I just don't think looking back that that was, all the, that that was at all the case. Yeltsin led a coalition of forces in Soviet society, some of which were not too healthy and some of which we saw in 1993. And I think by thinking this was a coalition of democratic minded people, which we largely did, like in Poland or in the Balts, that the turnout would be much the same. Uh, and it wasn't. Third, I would, uh, looking back, we gave much too much credit to Gorbachev's capable of maneuvering, uh, and I think that's where the book is extreme, extremely good, that Gorbachev, as he outmaneuvered the hard, so-called hardliners around him, would almost, with his political skills, we thought, almost inevitably lead the country to a more formed, kinder, gentler USSR. And it didn't work. And it took a long time, I think, for those of us who watched closely, to see that. Now, we would reduce everything to hardliners and reformers. Gorbachev was a reformer. He was Nasha, as the Russians would say. And thus, we tended to put a lot of confidence not only in his skills, but in his leadership. And thus, I was surprised, but in an accurate way, Vlad, the way you described the situation, which I think is much more accurate than what we thought so at the time. And then finally, I think uh, we misunderstood Yeltsin. For a long time, he was seen as a, a threat to our guy, Gorbachev. And then once he became a serious challenger, we had to stop talking about his drinking or what he might have done on an airplane and so forth, because he became Nasha in a way that Gorbachev had. And so experts around town were sort of picking one or the other and judging their political prospects in that way. Uh, now, what did we miss? Well, we missed a lot. And let me give you three or four examples of what we missed. Number one, there was considerable circumstantial evidence no longer online, but in my huge file over here, that Yeltsin and the coup plotters did have pretty serious contacts between January and uh, uh, the date of the coup. It's suggested in a number of Russian publications that a fellow, some of you may remember, named Yuri Skolkov was a liaison to the future coup plotters. Yeltsin himself, as I recall, in June 1991, talked about a possible coup against Gorbachev. So, I've looked, talked to a lot of people about this relationship, what it meant. Did it meant that mean that Yeltsin was playing both sides? Did it mean that Khrushchev was trying to cooperate Yeltsin? I don't know for sure. It's intriguing. It's tantalizing. But in any case, we missed it. Uh, second, I would say 
we missed the entire centrality of money in the system. We have a few students of, uh, of uh, uh, our great Harvard mentors here, here on the panel, but let's say the issue of party money, the issue of the origins of the oligarchs, the issue of the uh, role of the KGB in creating a corporate state, confirmed to me personally by Khrushchev, but also uh, in a lot of dimensions, I think we almost entirely missed. I uh, remember a senior Russia hand at state telling me in about 1990, well, you know, Don, with this party money thing, we don't pay any attention to it at all. And now it turns out to be a, uh, a strong element in Putin's Russia, even stronger than it has been in Russian society, money and power historically. And finally, I would say that we miss the whole ferment of the second and third tier nomenclatura, the second and third tier Soviet bureaucracy, which had pretty much given up, I think, on the, the, the official ideology uh, several years before this. And these are the people who the coup really, by the mid-1990s, brought to power. And these are the people who wanted privileges. These are the people who wanted uh, money and travel. These are the people, ultimately, who uh, put a break on the reforms that we were all so, so hopeful about. And I highly recommend an article written about this time last year by Mr. Gudkov, who talks a lot about this. But uh, Gavril Popov talked about it in an article, not online, but 1992, talking about this was really the victory of the rising generation of nomenclatura. Uh, this, again, has lessons for Yeltsin, for Putin's Russia. We might be saying the same thing now. I don't know. It's worth discussing. But I will pause there, Angela, and leave 93 and the uh, uh, rest of the uh, aftermath of all of this to my good friends, Jim Pavel and Fiona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don, and it is intriguing. Maybe it's in the answer to the question about why Yeltsin was able to run around freely during the coup. Exactly. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. yes. Fiona, over to you. Well, thanks so much. I mean, this is great to be able to do this event. And um, in the interest of time, because we did lose um, some time at the beginning, uh, with our own uh, technical difficulties, I'll just make a, a few points. First of all, I, I just want to commend uh, Vlad's book um, to everyone again, because I think it makes some really important points. I mean, as you said at the very beginning there, Angela, you know, we have certain myths about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Many of them coming from the United States perspective are based on our own agency in this, the whole idea that the pressures coming from the outside uh, from uh, the Reagan administration, Margaret Thatcher, I mean, the UK, the kind of the Western NATO uh, had um, uh, a really um, uh, important role to play. And, and indeed, as you know, as Vlad lays out, there's all these factors play some kind of role in creating what we might call an unstable internet, <laughs> given you know, Vlad's reference at the very beginning. The Soviet Union most definitely had some technical difficulties, just to use the metaphor from our uh, event today. And there were many different uh, aspects uh, of this. But ultimately, um, as Vlad makes very clear, there wasn't those external pressures and it wasn't all of the internal pressures that we assumed. You know, many of us, you know, from also at the outside looked at, you know, the role of the Baltic states, you know, the rise of uh, environmental uh, movements that morphed into national movements in the Baltic states um, in particular. Uh, the tensions that emerged in the Caucasus in places like uh, Georgia and uh, Azerbaijan, the, you know, the conflict that was emerging between Armenia and Azerbaijan and this idea of these centrifugal forces, um, as you know, Vlad was uh, relaying out there, that also pulled apart, because that actually had a, a real impact on the fall of the Russian Empire during World War I. And we kind of assumed that the same forces that we saw playing into the Russian Revolution of nationalism and you know, religious strife uh, were also a factor in pulling apart the Soviet Union. But really, as Vlad makes it clear, it's an act of political rebellion by you know, the core group of Russia and Yeltsin and all of these contacts that uh, Don is referencing. And I think that is, as Vlad says, a really important cautionary tale, not just for Vladimir Putin. And I think of a kind of a potential rebellion of people around him and those who are not happy with the current state of affairs, because as you know, as Vlad's saying, that personal element of tensions between Gorbachev and Yeltsin, very different views of how things should be done. Yeltsin, uh, you know, basically conspiring, there was a conspiracy theory, right, with um, the, the heads of 
Belarus and Ukraine that he brought along to the Belovitsky Pusha, you know, to basically put the nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union, you know, the three of them, but very much, you know, kind of led by um, uh, by Yeltsin, which basically brought the um, Soviet Union to an end. So it wasn't really an implosion, but a kind of a deliberate destruction by, um, you know, a kind of a group centered around Boris Yeltsin who had different sets of ambitions. And I mean, that could, you know, we we're looking at our own political polarization and problems here in the United States. You know, one could, you know, see some sort of parallels in, in uh, our own setting and in other uh, settings where you see kind of machinations in political parties and in leadership uh, situations. So I think that is a really important um, element that, um, you know, Vlad has brought into here. Uh, you know, we also uh, know, of course, that the economic factors played an important role and um, perceptions about how Gorbachev was not handling the economy. And, um, you know, um, uh, Vlad mentioned Vladimir Putin's decision to focus on macroeconomic stability and uh, on making Russia solvent again, not just great again, but solvent again in the first uh, two terms of his presidency. And he was also deriving from there another book, uh, the lessons of another book about the collapse of the Soviet Union by Yega Gaidar, you know, one of the architects of um, what became shock therapy in the 1990s, channeling his own lessons from the mistaken reform uh, uh, process that um, uh, he uh, embarked on with other reformers under Yeltsin, but also the lessons from the mismanagement of reforms under Gorbachev and uh, the bankruptcy uh, that emerged of the state that made it so difficult to keep the state together uh, and the importance of fiscal uh, um, uh, federalism and uh, having a tight grip on the coffers and that promoting the strength of the centre. And in terms of things that we missed, and then I think things that play out, and I just want to make sure that Pavel and Jim come in here. I mean, I don't think we from the outside fully understood the nature of the system. We focus a lot on communism and on central planning and assumed uh, in many respects, I mean, not all of us here on this Zoom call, but there was an assumption made that when you removed the Communist Party and therefore the sort of superficial superstructure of the state, the ideology was kind of already you know, fading off to grey and sort of disappearing. And then when you um, remove central planning, you would suddenly have an overnight transformation. That was part of the assumptions that Jäger Gaidau and others made too. He says this himself, the sort of assumptions about how you would stimulate through privatization and you know, kind of mass transformation, the emergence of a bourgeoisie and democracy would be strengthened by this, that it would follow patterns you saw elsewhere, completely missing you know, the, the whole structure of the Russian economy that many of us have been looking at ever since and how everything was intertwined. And basically, when uh, Yeltsin himself would not have seen this, when you know Russia basically seceded, uh, you know, taking others with it, there was the great unraveling uh, of an incredibly complex system, supply chains. It wasn't just the personal inter interconnections of people scattered, you know, and had been dispatched across the whole vast landmass of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, with family and other personal collections, elites in these very complex connections that had been in the in the Soviet hierarchy. But, you know, what passed for trade and supply chains and, you know, uh, economic sets of interactions, you know, a factory uh, somewhere in the Urals might get all of its supplies from someone like Uzbekistan and uh, Azerbaijan. And suddenly, you know, their supplies weren't there. The famous um, story of how the Kyrgyz in Kyrgyzstan had to uh, basically cull all of their livestock. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, because the only market for their meat products was actually Moscow, and they were suddenly cut off in an independent country. And we never fully processed the complexities of all of this. So, you know, that is also a part of the picture that we did not understand fully the nature of the system, nor the political dynamics that Vlad so uh, accurately captures and, uh, and conveys that were going on at the top. And you know, beyond really our full understanding, and beyond yeah, in many respects our perceptions and information that we had. Thank you, Fiona. Pavel. Yes, I'm very glad to be a part of the conversation, and let me spend my five minutes in it reflecting on a very particular feature of the collapse of the Soviet Union: the tanks. Uh, I think tanks in the street of Moscow was really a strong impression during the coup in August. It wasn't the first time that I saw tanks up close as ever a graduate from Moscow State University. I earned the rank of lieutenant in reserve and that meant some basic military training, much as Vlad did probably. But waiting for the tanks to come during that miserable night under drizzling rain around the White House was something very different. <laughs> 
and gradually by the morning, the understanding emerged that they didn't know what they were doing, that they didn't have a chance because they didn't have a clue. And the follow-up question immediately was why? Why the colossal military organization of the Soviet Union wasn't enough to hold the state together? They one of accepted analytical wisdom of those days was that the Soviet Union didn't have a military machine, it was a military machine. And there were good reasons to believe in that because indeed the military organizations was colossal and it was supposed to be able to hold under much pressure and it didn't. And it's possible to bring up kind of this, uh, reasons why uh, the military organization did receive a sequence of very heavy body blow in the years before. At least five I would count just for, uh, for example, starting with the INF Treaty, which the top brass didn't like at all. There were missile systems they wanted to keep and here we go, Gorbachev insisted. Then it was a withdrawal from Afghanistan, a very painful defeat, which really did a lot of uh, discredit to the military organization. Then it was a, a breakdown of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, which meant withdrawal of hundreds of thousands of troops from Eastern Europe. Very painful operation. Uh, then it was the Gulf War, which suddenly demonstrated to the Russian top brass what the modern war really was about. And they understood that they are not able to do it. And then finally, it was a coup uh, in which the military was the main instrument. And the pathetic failure of the whole coup really demonstrated that the, uh, that the military isn't really good uh, for performing these tasks. Yes, this kind of sequence uh, explains that the military machine was confused and upset and didn't function well, but still. The big question remains how it might possibly happen. And the only answer I can uh, produce is that the Soviet Union, in fact, was much more than a military machine. There was a lot and a lot in the States which didn't fit into that image. There was interesting developments in the society which was impossible to capture because sociology wasn't really at that moment an accepted science. There was a new generation coming up, very angry, a very dynamic generation which wanted change. That was the song of the day, and they didn't want to be a part of that military machine at all. There were all sort of ethnic political conflicts, and the army was called each time to suppress them in Tbilisi and in Baku, in Vilnius and in Riga, and each time only aggravated the situation. There were economic developments outside the military industrial complex, which uh, can really change the uh, character of interactions in the society. There were all sort of party political intrigues culminating in Belarusia and Russia. And all these impacts came together to overcome the impact of the, uh, of the military machine which tried to hold the state together and obviously failed. What is my bottom line here? You look at Russian military might and Russian militarism today, and it looks very impressive. And the situation at the border of Ukraine looks scary. But it's useful to remember that at least 10 times less than what used to be in Soviet Union. That 100,000 troops on the border of Ukraine is not the same as a half a million grouping in East Germany alone. It is a, order of, a different order of magnitude. And Russia is not really a military machine. There is too much in the state which doesn't fit into that image, including Putin's oligarchs. So I wouldn't overestimate the capacity of that state to mobilize for real war. That's my bottom line, thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Um, before I turn to Jim, I do want to um, read out your, one of the questions that we've received many, um, just and have you, Pavel, say a little bit more about it. To what extent was defeat in the Soviet-Afghan war responsible for the collapse of confidence in the Soviet regime? You want me to answer now? All right. Uh, it was an important impact, and not only the defeat, but also the start of the war, the very senselessness of that. And so the, the erosion was kind of gradual and coming. But nevertheless, the withdrawal was pretty dignified. It ju was just, wasn't just the propaganda, but overall, the image of that withdrawal was certainly very different from what we saw last summer uh, in, uh, in Kabul. 
So yes, it was an impact, but I wouldn't say uh, decisive. I wouldn't say even even massive. Uh, I think the army after that was really able to regroup and regain uh, what it saw as its main purpose. Thank you. Jim, over to you. Well, thanks for having me uh, as part of this and um, congrats to Vlad on the new book. Uh, he and I first met uh, in 1989 or so uh, when I was finishing my dissertation out in California. Um, in fact, I remember having a great visit with him to the Golden Gate Bridge Vista Point. So I've been learning from him ever since. And so it's just wonderful to be part of this. I wanted to just make three points uh, tying together some events and issues of that period with where we are today. Um, when George H.W. Bush went to West Germany in the spring of 1989 and laid out a vision for a Europe whole and free, um, a vision that then evolved in the 1990s uh, to be this idea of a Europe whole free and at peace, the idea was that Russia would be a part of that. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to think about the different visions though, that the US, Russia, uh, US and Russia had for what that meant. Uh, the US vision for Europe was a vision where the United States dominated European security. That's why the United States wanted to ensure the maintenance of NATO. It's why the United States uh, supported NATO's enlargement. Uh, the United States was going to run uh, European security after the end of the Cold War, and Russia could join as a junior partner. Um, and so that was, that's different than a Europe where the United States and Russia would make the decisions uh, together uh, about Europe, uh, which is what the Soviet Union uh, and I would argue Russia wanted what Putin seems to want today in the calls for, uh, you know, U.S.-Russia uh, bilateral talks. Um, and I think one of the things we should take away from all of that, the U.S. vision, the Russian vision, uh, is that um, it's, it's really important for the United States and Europe to have a very different relationship today. The United States doesn't need to run European security. There should be greater balance between the United States and Europe. And there do, there there do have to be discussions about Russia's, uh, about European security, the European security architecture and where Russia fits in. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should uh, be um, uh, sanguine uh, about sort of the Russian, uh, the Russian approach. We shouldn't be, I, I don't think that we should be um, talking as much as we are about what we can give Putin uh, in order for him to stand down uh, from the border. And I think we should be talking at least as much as, as uh, about the things that he should be uh, giving uh, the West and Ukraine uh, as we try to forge a path forward in European security. But I just think it's worth reflecting on sort of these different visions for Europe. Second point I wanted to make is, is to go back to a speech that Bill Clinton gave on April 1st of 1993. Uh, just before he went to Vancouver to meet with Boris Yeltsin for the first time. He talked about three transitions that were taking place in post-Soviet Russia, uh, from an authoritarian state to a democracy, from a command to a market economy, and from an empire to a modern nation state. And I think it's worth thinking about that latter point. It was something that former national security advisors, Bignev Brzezinski, spoke a lot about. I think he influenced Clinton's thinking on this issue. And it was the idea that if Russia successfully let go of its empire, it could be a normal nation state uh, engaging with other European powers um, as, a, as a nation state, not as, a, not as an empire. Uh, but it had to let that empire go um, and especially uh, had to let go of Ukraine. Um, and that, of course, is still this contentious point. Uh, Yeltsin did seem willing to accept Ukraine's independence, certainly as has been discussed. Uh, he certainly did so as part of the effort for Russia to become independent uh, in 1991. And so Ukraine's independence and that of the other republics was, was valuable for him in his battle with Gorbachev. Uh, 
uh, and to, to um, cause, help cause the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, but even Yeltsin um, still had uh, concerns uh, about where these other republics would be going. And even he, uh, in 1997, sought uh, an, a, an agreement with Bill Clinton that Ukraine uh, would not become a member of NATO. Um, and he was unsuccessful in that, um, just as uh, Putin will be unsuccessful in getting any kind of legal guarantees uh, that NATO won't enlarge um, to include Ukraine, even though Ukraine is not going to become a member of NATO um, as far as the eye can see. And the last point I want to make, I, I've been teaching um, the last several years, I've been teaching a grad class at American University on the United States and Russia since 1991. And I've noted that we start the semester um, with um, a Russian president asking his American counterparts for help building a market democracy. And we then get toward the end of the semester and uh, the Trump years, uh, where we see an American president asking his Russian counterpart to help build corrupt authoritarianism. Uh, and um, Fiona has described this convergence and asked this question about how we sort of got to a point of, of these two looking more and more similar in her great book. Uh, but certainly that arc uh, of that trajectory over the last 30 years has become, has been quite a journey. And given the uncertainty surrounding the post 2025 period in the United States, uh, we're not uh, necessarily done with this yet. Um, but I think it's really important as we think back to the collapse of the Soviet Union to reflect back on the hopes that existed 30 years ago for the United States uh, and for many Russians, including President Yeltsin and Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev, that Russia would become a democratic market-oriented state integrated into the West rather than clashing with it over the basic principles of the European order and more broadly the international order. Uh, as is the case today, and I hope we can get into that in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, you've almost taken the words from my mouth. Before I go to the questions from the audience, I do want to get to this question that you've just raised. You talked about uh, Bill Clinton talking about transitions, and I note that, you know, in political science we had uh, in the 90s, to some extent the 2000s, all these th theories about transition. And then I think a lot of that's been discredited now. Some countries did make the transitions, but an awful lot of them didn't make them or they reversed them. And I, so I think uh, it, that leads to the question that you've just raised. Um, why were we wrong? We probably in the West, but also people in Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed, um, that, uh, you know, about believing that Russia would want to become more integrated with the West, would want to move on the path towards greater freedom, democracy, and things like that. Why did we get it so wrong? Uh, and I will start with Vlad and then go around to all of you to answer that. Well, this is, a, thank you, Angela. This is what I was trying to explain to myself as I was writing the book, because a lot of um, 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 ambiguity and ambivalence that I felt even when I was writing the book, because one, you know, the in, immense material was there and evidence was all out, but uh, the problem of interpretation was still unclear. And indeed, uh, uh, what, what taught me a lot accidentally uh, uh, was when I discovered the papers of Democratic Russia, that movement uh, that created in January 1990, it's now safely stored at the Hoover Institution, and I was going through this and I, uh, of course, uh, remembering myself 30 years ago, I would have been among them. And I was, in a sense, among them, you know, when I was between Moscow and the United States and I went to fellowships at that time. But reading it 30 years later made it completely unreal. Those guys base, started with the base, same basic point as as uh, as as the Bolsheviks in 1917, the the more we eradicate eradicate whatever uh, whatever exists of the old order, including the state, the easier it would be then to turn Russia uh, and its people and its people uh, to into this ideal that they held, you know, pro you know, pretty much 
uh, uh, like Americans. I was told a joke by one of my interviewees at Stanford. He had a, a very important liberal deputy from Moscow. He, he looked around and he told uh, you know, his vis-a-vis -vis that he wants to become a Russian politician to turn Russia into a new California. Uh, how he can do that in like 20 years or so was the question. And uh, his American vis-a-vis -vis explained to him, well, first you emigrate to the United States, then you wait for five years, you get a green card, then your citizenship, you run for a, a seat at, in California and you get there. And he was, he completely couldn't understand that it's impossible to, to, to convert a, a, a deeply traumatized country with the people who went through all this we know, uh, you know, into a new California. But when you read the papers of the democratic Russia, you sort of get this collective sense of insanity. Uh, we, we should destroy it, you know, including the state. And they're particularly uh, hostile to the state because they thought it's a wrong type of state. You know, When we destroy it, we'll build the right type of state. And of course we had it before in 1917, right? I would uh, just uh, as a remark, I listened to Pavel's uh, eloquent speech about the military. And what I found, there's a lot of uh, a lot of hostility among the Democrats at the time, Russian Democrats, that is, towards the military, because it was an instrument of the old regime. It was the same kind of hostility, fortunately not so violent, as people had towards Tsarist officers in 1917. So we have certain repetitive pattern here. And by the way, the army, I uh, slightly disagree with my old friend Pavel. I don't think the army by itself was trained to protect the state. It was a, it was a huge monster without the political brains because it was told and trained not to go into politics under any circumstances. So when the political leadership, Gorbachev or Yeltsin, had the tug of war destroying the state, the military were powerless. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and of course, without the military, there was no state. There were, you know, there was Chechnya, uh, there, there were other, uh, you know, uh, skirmish, bloody skirmishes on, on the borderlands. There was a bloody civil war in Tajikistan. And the best they thought of is to call on a division, a uh, Russian well, division that still stayed there to restore order. And this is essentially how they, they managed uh, eventually to restore order in this Hobbesian environment of, of the post-Soviet Tajikistan. So, you know, the lesson to the Russian Democrats, you need a state, imperfect, but still you need a state. Wise words, Don. Sure. Uh... I want to remind everybody, not that you need reminding, that this was the era of Frank Fukuyama, the end of history. Ideology no longer mattered. So we thought there was almost a, uh, a determinism, Angela, to the transition. And so, uh, you know, we didn't pay a lot of attention to culture, Vlad. We didn't pay a lot of attention to Russian history. In fact, a lot of people were not that familiar with it. And uh, it wasn't out of a design to weaken Russia. It truly wasn't. It was just really dubious policy. And one reason I like your book so much, Vlad, is your Fall 91 section. When I was in language training, is excellent and very much needs to be paid attention to. So even today, Angela, you get, well, shock therapy was, I think, was a bad idea. And the answer is always, well, what would you have done, Don? And my answer is, well, you could have done a lot of things to mitigate the trauma of that was going on in the society, but we didn't really bother to do that at all. And, and then by 93, there became a contradiction between, so I was going to say propping up, supporting Yeltsin and carrying on economic reforms that were clearly even then not working. And we just sort of went down that off ramp into what happened. And again, a lot of factors, culture, history, determination of policies, it was really, I think, done, done very poorly, even as how we handled the security challenges about nuclear weapons, I thought were done very skillfully. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, 
Well, I think I'm just going to be, you know, echoing, you know, the same things here. I think, you know, what Vlad um, was mentioning there is, first of all, it's the destruction. And then, as Don is saying, there's the determinism point of this. So, you know, I mentioned that before, that we assume that once we removed the Communist Party, the ideology had gone, uh, that immediately um, something else would flow out of this. And, you know, Leti Yeager Gaida reflecting on that also coming from, you know, Demo democratic Russia, as Vlad is, um, you know, referring to, out of that kind of group that really thought you could do this overnight transformation, realising that that was never going to be the case and that they had made a series of misjudgments, just like, uh, as uh, Vlad says, you know, the Bolsheviks and others did too when they destroyed uh, the Ancien Regime and uh, the Russian Empire and uh, the Russian state apparatus. And in part, that was also because many of uh, the old um, czarist bureaucracy decided to leave because they didn't want to work with uh, the, uh, the Bolsheviks, immediately kind of depriving the state of uh, you know, people who actually knew <laughs> how to run uh, a government and knew how to uh, run a country. And of course, then the Bolsheviks immediately had to set up their own um, emergency committee to kind of step in and try to build something new. And of course, you know, we had the same kind of thing in uh, the Soviet period, the destruction of the old state, literally, because it was so far flung. Everything was an integral component. As I mentioned before, Kyrgyzstan producing all of this meat just for the markets in Moscow. And suddenly, you know, all the, the livestock are over here. And, you know, kind of basically Moscow's over here. They're in completely different countries. The supply lines have broken down and there's meat shortages in Moscow and um, in Kyrgyzstan they have to kill off all the livestock. You know, these were that was just one small um, facet of a much larger unraveling as a result of the destruction. And then no one had, knew how to pick up the pieces. Certainly the kind of the Washington consensus of how you run an economy, the kind of efforts that I was engaged in back at the Kennedy School of Government at the time of strengthening democratic institutions. We had no idea uh, of how to kind of put something new in place there. As Vlad said, you know, the, the, that great uh, recommendation. For the, uh, for the person who wanted to run things like California, just go to California and run things from there, uh, it was, uh, you know, really the, the, the only solution here. And when I think back um, just to the uh, reference point that I made, you know, against this backdrop of what we might call market Bolshevism, this whole idea that you could transform it, we also thought we could transform the politics, even though, you know, in the market uh, sense, there'd be no um, history of private property. There'd also been no history of really true independent parties in a political party system. I mean, there were parties in the Tsarist era, uh, the Cadet Party and a whole host of others that uh, uh, fielded candidates for the first Russian parliament, the Russian Duma, and the late period of the Tsarist um, era. But these parties weren't really parties in the kind of sense that we understand them um, in the West. And so Democratic Russia and these other kind of groups that were emerging, some of them tried to uh, emulate the parties of the kind of pre-revolutionary period you know, as we're trying to set something up from scratch and we'd bring all the party leaders uh, we did this at the kennedy school with the strengthening democratic institutions project we had a russian political party program we brought all of these leaders over we took them to iowa we took them to new hampshire we we introduced them uh, to all kinds of political technologists you know the people who run campaigns what did they take away with them how to manipulate democracy because they saw the role of political action committees. They saw how you could manufacture a candidate. They saw how you could manipulate things like the Electoral College, you know, for example, and how you ran a campaign. It wasn't the grassroots democracy. It wasn't the kind of ideas of kind of giving people a stake. Because, the, um, you know, as uh, everyone's mentioning before, trust in the communist system, which was, you know, theoretically a massive grassroots um, entity, had completely uh, faded away. And you know, what we showed them was how to build a party from the top down, the elite, as Vlad's talking about the people from Vlad, uh, democratic Russia who had no idea what they were doing, but everything was kind of from the top down. It was already the idea of a managed democracy, not to how to build something up from the grassroots. And I think that also then fed into the path that we've seen Russia being on ever since of uh, this kind of artificiality of kind of creating the institutional setup of a state after the destruction of the old one with, you know, very little uh, continuity and the same with the economy uh, that, you know, we pulled everything apart and somehow expected it to uh, pop back together again. And that act of restoration of Putin ever since has been kind of an inevitable consequence of that. Thank you. And I would recommend uh, if anyone has a spare hour and a half to watch the movie Spinning Boris, which is about when the American political consultants went over to Russia in 1996 
and they rescued Yeltsin from single digit popularity to winning uh, the election in 1996. Pavel. Yes, uh, we have no argument I think here, but my two cents I want to add to the question of why the transition went so wrong can boil down to two words, uh, injustice and inequality. And I think the immediate impact of inequality was extremely painful because it was so much you know, very direct, very um, unexpected empowerment of the vast social groups and an enrichment on the other scale, uh, very visible in your face that uh, the whole idea of democratic transition was compromised with the masses. And uh, injustice was also kind of gradually building up the feeling of injustice in how the Russians treated by, uh, by the others. It was very easy to play on that, to orchestrate, kind of to exploit these feelings towards the um, ends. And it's uh, probably possible to point out that these two problems are not only problems for transition from uh, communist to uh, democracy, they are problems for authoritarian regimes as well. I think that's exactly these two things, injustice and inequality, propped the protests in Belarus last, uh, in summer uh, 2020. The difference is that for democracy, it is this public you know, discontent, this uh, outrage, is much deeper problem than for authoritarian issues because the authoritarians know how to suppress the dissent. They know how to how to treat those who are discontent, how to uh, uh, respond to all these foreign agents. But I think the problem uh, is probably at the moment uh, as acute for Putin's regime as it was for, for uh, Lukashenko regime uh, last year. Jim? Yes. <laughs> In September of 1990, I was on a research trip to Moscow. And I ended up um, getting to know um, a guy named Alyeg Rumyantsev, who I think at the time was a parliamentarian. Anyway, he, he viewed himself as the James Madison of Russia, clearly. Uh, and he was holding a number of town halls on, because um, uh, they were drafting a constitution. And um, so I went to the town halls. Uh, I went to several of them. And uh, they all had the same dynamic. Uh, he would get up and talk about, you know, all these very great theoretical ideas about democracy uh, and what should go in the Constitution. Um, and then would take audience questions. First question was always the same. What, what are you going to do about the fact that I can't find any bread in the supermarket? Second question was always the same. What are you going to do about the tobacco shortage? I mean, you know, people want the government to deliver. And it's great to have democratic ideals. I uh, firmly believe in them. Uh, and I think that uh, it's important in our country that we keep them. Uh, and, you know, I hope in other countries where they don't have them that they can achieve them. Uh, but governments do have to deliver. And I think, you know, this was a big challenge. And, the 1990s and it and helps explain the rise of Putin, his popularity and so on uh, in the 2000s. And, you know, we could say, oh, well, you know, he got lucky high oil prices and so on. But I mean, you got to be able to deliver um, and the principles uh, alone aren't sufficient. And I, I think there wasn't enough attention paid to to that. Wise words, Jim. OK, um, I we do have a little more extra time now because we started late. So I am going to. Uh, read out a question uh, that was submitted yesterday, um, which I think is a very important one. Do you think that the Russian government will ever publicly come to terms with the Soviet 20th century legacy, um, obviously of, uh, of Stalin, of the purges, um, in the same way that the German government has seriously attempted to come to terms with its own legacy? The question of that wonderful German word for Gangenheitsbewältigung. Uh, Vlad, let me start with you. 
Well, it's a huge question, and we saw some serious attempts at that. Just at this moment, we're discussing when the the Russian state will close down memorial society. And, you know, uh, the, the irony is that memorial emerged on the peak of that effort to confront the past. Uh, but I would say mm, it's not simply path dependency, as people so often mention about Russia, that Russia, I don't believe that Russia is destined to go back to some kind of, you know, uh, mythical uh, dark ages. Um, but uh, you, you, know, you confront the past and you see that the past is never the past, of course. It's not even air. It's, it's very resistant matter. And again, one could see a group of well-meaning intellectuals uh, supported that in 88 through 90 something uh, by many, many uh, Russians and non-Russians whose uh, relatives uh, had perished during the great terror in the past, supporting this effort to repudiate this past. Yet the past kept coming back through uh, one form or another. So that I think I should, you know, basically repeat what I uh, already spoke about the Russian Democrats. You know, it's impossible to get rid of the past in one go, uh, or, or even with sustained effort in 10, 20, 30 years. And we know Germany did not do it overnight either. It, it took Germans uh, the whole historical period to go through the, you know, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, the change of generation, the highly, highly uh, propitious geopolitical uh, situation. Usually people say, oh, they were defeated and they had to do it. No, no, no. They were members of NATO. They were already becoming members of European community. They felt safe. They had American umbrella. And, uh, you know, uh, that gave them that proverbial cocoon within which they, they could somehow oh, still with a lot of no, uh, heat generated, a lot of trauma uh, uh, attack their past. And hopefully they overcame it. For Russians, it's much more difficult. They, you know, had their state restored after a decade rightly or wrongly, with wrong means or right wings, they had their state back. So they still remember when they were practically stateless, as, as the recent film reminded us, and you know, watch it. Uh, and now they have to think about the past. They uh, are told by their government that they're in this geopolitical situation, confronted on one side by the whole Europe, led by the United States, not exactly friendly Turkey in the South, and China, who is sort of a partner and a friend, but it's, it's a huge country and may, may one day uh, change its way towards Russia. So how to approach your past in a, in a sort of uh, relaxed, cocoon-like way like the Germans did, I don't know. And frankly, as long as this geopolitical tensions and uncertainty uh, would last, you definitely would see a popularity of Stalin among some people. At first I joked about it. I thought, oh, okay, it would go away. But then Stalin keeps, uh, keeps being mentioned uh, by people uh, with this uh, fantastic phrase. What do you think about Stalin? Long silence and then, but he won the war. So this phrase, but he won the war, <laughs> it's, 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 it's millions of brains. And as long as you don't resolve at least the question of uh, European security architecture to which Jim referred, you know, inshallah, one day we'll resolve it. Only after that, I can see Russians definitely uh, uh, in a situation when they can overcome the, the, their past. Thank you very much. And I would say even the Germans weren't quite as relaxed about all this as you said. I mean, when Willy Brandt knelt at the Warsaw Ghetto Monument, he was roundly criticized by a lot of Germans for, uh, you know, for this, for admitting this kind of thing. So even for the Germans, it was difficult. Um, Fiona, I think I'm going to give you the next question, which is, um, how would you relate the events that we've been talking about, the fall of the Soviet Union, to what we're seeing now between Russia and Ukraine? 
Well, certainly it frames the whole dilemma. I mean, Jim has talked about the European security order, that constant search for one on the part of the Russians, one which is on their terms rather than ours, as Jim you know, described, there was all these competing ideas, but they were very much driven by, you know, we who assumed ourselves to be the victors of the Cold War, particularly because of our own interpretation of what had happened inside um, of the Soviet Union that precipitated the collapse. That idea again of the external pressure, the lack of competitiveness, you know, kind of internationally, the centrifugal forces uh, uh, of nationalism in the constituent republics, for example, are not understanding at all that political dynamic at the centre that Vlad, you know, so expertly um, writes about um, in the book. But again, you know, kind of we have to remember that for Russia, and Vlad was just talking about this, about the eventual restoration of the state, 30 years ago, uh, 1991, it might have been again for Yeltsin, but for most Russians, it was a it was a huge loss. And this is, you know, for Putin and the people around him, the fact that he is always referencing, we always reference and quote him, talking about the great catastrophe of the 21st century, the 20th century, you'd say probably the 21st as well, because it's bleeding over into it, um, is uh, that, that loss of the state. The second loss of the state after the destruction of uh, the Russian empire and uh, the Russian state by the Bolsheviks, and Putin's been quite critical about them, even as he's engaged in Soviet nostalgia. He hasn't really embraced the Bolsheviks in any you know, kind of major way and talks frequently about their act of destruction uh, and you know, many of his restorations of the kind of a fabric of a state of the mythology of a kind of a new state um, has been uh, by delving into the past of the pre-revolutionary past, the late Romanov period and even further beyond to the, you know, the kind of the rise of Muscovy and you know, the various grand princes of Kiev, hence again, tying into you kind of Ukraine. The past is really all about the present, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about, what Vlad is mentioning. And so Putin is bringing all of those pasts up into the present and making Ukraine the whole symbol of not just Russia's present, but also of its future. It's the symbol of a new, uh, uh, a new European security order, the kind of how Ukraine conducts itself or is made to conduct itself whether it's neutralized or neutered, because there's a whole um, dimension of, you know, kind of removing from Ukraine the, off the opportunity for self-defense. Uh, you know, Russia's pointing guns at it and, you know, Ukraine is uh, certainly not permitted to go for its own guns, uh, you know, to kind of protect itself from that. That's kind of, you know, all laid out there. That's, you know, how Ukraine fits into, you know, the rest of Europe. Is it a country or not a country? Putin's been saying for a very long time, including very famously telling George W. Bush, Andrew, you've cited this recently, at Bucharest in 2008 uh, during the NATO conference, uh, the summit in which there was the suggestion of Ukraine and Georgia both getting a NATO membership action plan. Uh, Putin tells George W. Bush, you know, George, Ukraine isn't really a country. You know, basically, it's kind of remnants uh, and, you know, part of it's in Austro-Hungary, I was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, part in the German Empire, et cetera, et cetera. You know, kind of basically, this nothing to look at here, move along. And of course, saying that again, in, in all of the missives ever since, uh, the annexation of Crimea, laying out this kind of idea again that, you know, Vlad and, uh, you know, Jim are talking about, about constant encirclement of Russia, the kind of the loss, it's the regathering of the Russian lands, the linkages back to the Tsars, or in one case, the Tsarina of uh, Catherine the Great, and Putin making, you know, Ukraine, what happens to Ukraine, particularly Crimea, part of his own legacy. You know, we're getting into the whole discussion now about the future, not just of Russia, but the future of Putin and the system and the people around him that have been framed and shaped by that loss of 30 years ago. Look, I mean, Vladimir Putin would never have been president of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, without the collapse of the Soviet Union, the likelihood of his meteoric rise from, at, at, at that point, you know, kind of a former KGB, you know, officer who'd just been dispatched to Dresden and, you know, then is kind of like coming back. You know, he says it ruined his trajectory. Well, guess what, <laughs> President Putin, you wouldn't have been on that trajectory to the very top. I'm not quite sure where you would have been. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have been, actually, none of us would have been really doing many of the things we were doing today if it had not been for the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? Uh, Pavel wouldn't be in Oslo. Uh, Vlad, you might be still in Moscow, but not quite in the in the guise of LSC professor and, you know, former professor from Temple. We None of us have written all of these books. You know, we'd all be doing something different. But Vladimir Putin is the president of Russia. Wow, what an enormous success. We ought to actually be reminding him of this. This great opportunity that came uh, for him out of this. But now he's thinking about how he stays in office 
you know, we were invoking Lukashenko before, um, who's been uh, you know, the president of uh, Belarus by hook or by crook uh, since 1994, and Putin wants to stay in office even longer than he's already been there out till 2036. And how does that happen? And part of that is this whole mobilization around Ukraine. So, you know, everything that we're talking about today leads us uh, rather sadly to this kind of predicament that we have now that Putin is prepared to resolve his own dilemmas about his own security and the security of his own position out to 2036 at the expense of Ukraine. And um, this is all about Vladimir Putin and his systems, not just Russia's own security dilemma, how you mobilize, how you constitute something new to move off into the future. And it's not really, there is no threat to Russia. Let's be honest about it. And the only threat to Vladimir Putin is from inside. It's what Vlad talks about in his book. You know, the same kind of dynamic that Gorbachev experienced, you know, that tension with Yeltsin. And, you know, uh, Navalny, uh, you know, a real competitor, perhaps, you know, the Yeltsin of his time, you know, as a competitor, Putin is in jail. Uh, Putin's trying to, you know, warn off the others uh, for perhaps the machinations. And what Putin has got to fear is really the domestic dynamic, not anything from external uh, uh, threats, because we're not a threat. Ukraine is most definitely not a threat. China could potentially be a sort of challenge uh, down the line, but certainly not now. The world around you know, Putin and around Russia is probably more propitious than at any other time in the, in, in the past. Thank you. And Don, I will give you the last question. I'm sorry we ha won't have time to get to more questions and have everyone answer them. Uh, and, th and this question comes from someone who wants to know, what is Putin's ultimate aim? Is he trying to restore the Soviet Union? Um, is he trying to restore the Russian empire? What's he trying to do? I, uh, <laughs> good question to end on. I, I think that uh, he is trying to restore Russia's greatness. And that is different than the Soviet Union. That is a combination of of uh, a strategic culture, a sense of its own history that cannot think of Russia as any of the other way than, than uh, a great power. And I think he's gonna, his flexibility, his opportunism, his ability to exploit the uh, weakness of his, weaknesses of his adversary, uh, uh, I think is, is very challenging for West, as Fiona just said. There's no threat to Russia, but as long as Russia cannot think of itself as anything other than a great power, a Eurasian power, I think this is going to be a continuing, a continuing challenge. Pavel, I will give you the last word on the same question. All right. Yes, I agree with Don. Uh, and I think it's exactly this, uh, this um, drive to assert Russia's status as a great power that gives real urgency these days to the crisis with Ukraine. Uh, your previous question, Angela. Because it's always suddenly an understanding that if Ukraine goes its own way, if Ukraine builds ties with the West, and Russia is not a great power. Russia cannot possibly hope to become a great power if Ukraine departs in, the, in that direction. And what was done before to Ukraine uh, in Crimea and in Donbass is not enough to stop this, uh, this uh, departure. In fact, it accelerated it great. And Putin cannot really admit that it was his policies that were pushing Ukraine so strongly in the, uh, uh, towards the West. So I think the present day uh, military buildup on the borders of Ukraine is not just a hollow gesture, it's not just a fake, uh, it's not an attempt to you know, get attention from the United States and secure a summit um, with President Biden. Uh, it's, it's, it goes deeper, it, it is stronger, it is more dangerous. Thank you very much. Um, I. Um... I would like to thank our panelists very much. This was an excellent discussion. We could have gone on for hours. Uh, we've only touched some of the questions. I recommend you all to read Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I recommend you all to read uh, There's Nothing For You Here and countless articles and other things by all of our panelists here who have been discussing these issues. Um, and again, thank you for all the questions. Sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but I really think that this was a very important discussion. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.